The dice control debate, it is intense. Is it real? Is it fake? Fact? Fiction? Possible? Impossible? I'm telling you, there are people on both sides of those questions that have their heels dug all the way in. They've wrapped them, themselves in what they consider to be facts, and it is intense out there. I'll tell you what, I've done a lot of research on this. The facts are actually pretty gray, but we're going to get into all of it. I'm John. This is ProCrafts. Let's take a look and examine the truth about dice control. Before we get really deep into the discussion of dice control and get these questions answered, I want to make sure that we have a couple of basic definitions understood and agreed upon. So I define a dice controller as somebody who's actually trying to, and maybe can, impart actual control on the dice. They're picking numbers, they're choosing sets, they're throwing in a way that's going to produce the result that they want. A tier down from that would be a, somebody who calls himself a dice influencer, somebody who's not necessarily trying to control the outcome, but influence the outcome, throwing dice in a certain way that they hope will reduce some amount of randomness and influence the dice to produce numbers that they're hoping to see. Again, a level down from the controller level. A controlled shooter, to me, is somebody that exerts control over the throw. I don't know that a controlled shooter is trying to target numbers or anything of that nature, but they are definitely setting, they're throwing in a consistent way, they're trying to exert some sort of physical control over the dice, hoping for some kind of a consistent result. So a controlled shooter is just basically shooting under control with purpose. Uh, the experienced shooter, I think, encompasses all three of those. Now, the experienced shooter may have gone from controlled shooter to influencer to controller. They may be in any one of those buckets, but as an experienced shooter, what they're saying is, I've done this long enough. I can diagnose problems. I can make adjustments, and I've got the years under my belt that I feel very confident in what I'm doing, and they have kind of eclipsed the first three. So really, the experienced shooter could be the first on the list, but because they really you know, encompass all of it. I put them down here. That's an experienced shooter. Now, below these four, the last two folks are the, the rhythm roller and the random roller. Now, the rhythm roller is somebody who expects the dice to be random. They just happen to throw the dice in a predictable way. They grip them the same way. They release the same way. Their throws look the same. They aren't trying to influence anything, but they do have a nice rhythmic way that they throw versus the random roller who is usually the person who's shaking the dice and throwing them as hard as they can to impart extra amounts of randomness on the dice. They're really trying to bounce the rust off and get the randomness to really show. There's, they're both random. They're just random to different degrees or different purposes, I suppose. So the rhythmic roller, to me, is just more of a careful shooter where the random roller is really trying to be more violent with the dice and produce randomness. Now, throughout the series, I'll probably use the word controlled shooter to encompass the first four people. The, the dice controller, the dice influencer, the controlled shooter, and the experienced shooter are all gonna be, will probably all be bucketed by me as dice controllers because just ease of words. But as I roll these words in, and I may throughout the series, just be aware of what I'm talking about. So that's our basic definitions now. Um, I wanna get into the, the heart of the matter here and get some of these big questions answered about dice control. The first question we have to address here is the most important question. It's the one that frames the entire debate, which is, is every role random? I got to tell you, yes, every role is random. If that were not a true statement, you could throw the dice and have them stick on the table, and that's it. That would be perfect dice control. That's flat not possible. The dice will hit the table, they will hit the back wall, and they will hit the table again. There's three chances amongst many other factors that will impart randomness on the dice. Now, the debate is raging over the next two sub-questions to this one, which is A, is that a black and white thing? Are the dice pure random or are there degrees of randomness? And if there are degrees of randomness, how can somebody possibly change the random? That's the entirety of the dice control movement. Dice control is all about using physics to impart some predictability and reduce some of the random from the dice as they make those three hits and maybe even roll around a little bit to reduce the amount of random and or put the dice in a position to have a predictable result. So that's where the debate is. We're going to have an entire episode devoted to 
how crazy the randomness is on, on a throw and what a dice controller has to overcome. We're going to follow that up with the ways that dice controllers use physics to overcome that. So it's going to be a really interesting series. We're going to talk to a few controllers live. We're going to do some live rolling, some slow-mos. It's going to be really interesting to see how the physics actually affect both sides of the argument here. So that's, that is the, is every roll random question? Yes, it is. Stay tuned to find out how, why, and how it can be adjusted. The second question that I had was, what are dice controllers really trying to do? There's a lot of goals here. You could be trying to sharpshoot and actually pick numbers like I showed you before. They could be trying to just cluster numbers and say, let me throw the dice in a certain way so that a group or a certain group of numbers will be more likely to show up. The third option might be, I'm just trying to avoid the seven. And there's really three separate goals there. And I wanted to get an idea of what the controllers are trying to do. So I put a survey out and I had a group of them respond back. And I think the results are actually really interesting of what they see their role or what their goals are in terms of dice control. Let's take a look at that right now. Again, the first question that I asked was, what is your primary goal in trying to control the dice? Now we had about 84 people or so respond to the survey. And it looks like about 71.5% or so, so the large majority, say their number one goal is to avoid the seven. They want longer rolls, I'm assuming, so they can bet and have their bets pay more often than not. That seems to be a pretty reasonable goal. That's probably everybody's goal if they're a right side better anyway. The dice control community is saying they're trying to enable that to happen more often. I, I, I dig it. The second thing, though, was targeting certain numbers. So really... 23, 24% of people are saying that their primary goal is to target certain numbers as they're throwing them, which I found kind of interesting. Um, that's a higher percentage than I thought it was going to be. I kind of thought we were going to see more people that are just about the seven, but really there are people who are trying to target certain numbers and some folks have an other. We'll see what their response was. If I crack open their responses here, we'll see that. Some of the responses that I got were from actual people who control dice or try to. Some of them were haters that came in and just tried to mud up the work. So you will have to ignore those because this survey was really designed to get input from the dice controllers themselves. So you'll see here some repeats. Like we want to um, avoid the seven and hit the four and 10. That's somebody's dominant numbers. Um, two goals. One is avoid the seven. Two is get closer to the ATS bonuses, which makes sense. If you're trying to avoid the seven, your chance of the bonus bet might actually increase, which is very interesting. This person here uses the um, six, the five, six, six, eight set. Um, he's trying to hit horn numbers. It looks like for come out rolls. And here is somebody who just wants to mud up the work with their with their answer. So we'll ignore that one. The next question I asked was interesting. Why do you choose one dice set over another? Now, what you'll notice about dice controllers is that dice controllers will, and we'll get into this later. They will set the dice. They will definitely set the dice in certain ways so that they have certain numbers showing around get in front of the camera, certain numbers showing around the dice, trying to kind of cluster numbers, which is, again, this sub goal of influencing the dice. And they're saying, well, seven avoidance is why I choose a set because the set produces less sevens, they will say. Avoids a particular number was interesting, a few people there. And then here we have target specific numbers. So I found it interesting that 70% of the people say their goal is to avoid the seven but only 40% or 47% or are saying they choose a set because it avoids the seven. So to me, that feels like they're kind of arguing against themselves a little bit where, hey, I'm here to avoid the seven, but I'm choosing a set that actually targets specific numbers as their primary goal. I think that's a little bit, to me, orthogonal, the way I think about that, but it's interesting nonetheless. So those are the first two questions that I, I posed, which was, what are your goals? And what are you doing to achieve the goal? And again, you'll see that people are choosing sets that are being chosen for the purpose of seven avoidance and targeting numbers. Again, those the, the graphs are shrinking in a little bit towards each other. So we'll get into this later on. Um, there's going to be a series. Part of the series coming up will be how do dice controllers attempt to control the dice. We're going to talk about the sets they choose. I'm going to leave these next questions for that video. But for now, Let's focus on those two primary goals, which are seven avoidance, choosing sets that avoid the seven. Again, the majority, but not the not the same majority. So that's interesting. That's the dice controller's goal. So that answers really what question two was for us, which was what are the dice controllers doing? They're trying to avoid the seven. In most cases, the person setting the dice at the table with you is trying to avoid the seven. That's their entire goal. 
for the most part, 71% of the people are claiming that that is the reason for why they control the dice. So all of that begs the question, question three, can the dice be controlled? Well, that's the entire purpose of the series that I'm doing to see if the dice can be controlled. And we're going to dive into a lot of the ways the dice controllers approach controlling the dice. We'll see what's actually possible given physics and given some of the obstacles in their way. But I thought it'd be interesting for you to take a look at some of the comments that we got from people when I asked this question out on Reddit and on Facebook and other forums, can the dice actually be controlled? Take a look at some of these responses. All right, let's take a peek at some of the comments that I got when I asked the open-ended question of what do you think about dice control and why at Reddit and at Facebook. This is unlike the survey that I did with the dice controllers that was really targeted questions. This was more open-ended because I wanted to try and capture what people were thinking about the topic. And as you can imagine, um, it varies a lot, but there's a couple things that people honed in on. And I want to highlight four or five responses here just to kind of give you some talking points and things to consider as we go through the rest of the videos in the series. So here's the first one. Um, and I'll start negative with you because you get a, an overabundance of these kinds of responses where it's just unnecessarily negative and snarky. And frankly, it's kind of a BS answer to me, which is that, you know, Santa and Easter Bunny and Jesus are the only ones that can control dice. So they're fake. So it's got to be fake. To me, that's a lazy answer. It's just trying to stir things up. It's not helpful. Um, I, I show you this because I want conversation about this. I want this is going to be a topic that's going to go in a lot of directions. It's going to evoke some emotion. I don't want this kind of an emotional response in my comments. I'll just delete them. I'm here to have a common sense, grown up style debate about this thing and get to answers, not have this kind of crap. So I highlight this because there's too much of this in this in this conversation. This is not welcome here. Just so you know. Um, the second one here, though, is this, which is a person who calls out, he believes that if you practice anything, you can get better at it. And he uses golf and darts as the example. The snarky response, of course, dice is nothing like golf. Well, again, a bit of a lazy answer. Um, but I believe that it's a lot like golf. I think golf and dice are very, very um, much the same in the fact that there's multiple multiple, like 20 plus moving parts to get it all to work at all. A lot of things have to be perfect for it all to work. I think, I think you can practice and get better at stuff. I'm a coach and this is what I do for a living. So um, I like the fact that this poster brought that, that piece of it up. It's a thing for us to talk about for sure in future episodes. Um, here we talk finally getting some reality. There's no way to counteract the back wall. It's garbage. The person below says, yep, I agree. I tried it too. I tried it too. I did it every day and I still think it's bunk <laughs> and because um, of the back wall. I love that the person at the bottom though is still setting the dice, which is which is great. They, they don't believe in it, but they set the dice anyway, probably for rhythm and vibe and that kind of thing. But I think it's, it's interesting. This person brings up a great talking point for us, which is part of this, the negativity towards dice controllers is not about the skill itself. And what you'll find is that people who are anti-dice control most of them are not anti the practice. They're anti the people. And that's an important distinction to make because I want to get to the practice of it, not the people of it, but the people are here. And here's the thing where we talk about, this guy's talking about, yeah, he wants to talk about the real stuff, the back wall, the axis, all the things that are important. But he has to get this in because it's the emotional piece that he's feeling, which is dice controllers only talk about their great roles and how much money they won, right? I won, you know, in for 600, out for 12,000 with my 6262 set and, you know, whatever. And, and here we go, right? Um, that's off putting to people. And I think that feeds the narrative. This person's having a reaction to that. And I wanted to highlight that because this is the thing that makes people in that community kind of their own worst enemy sometimes. Okay, this person is highlighting a really big issue. And they're super negative about it. I agree with them as well on this. This is a hot button issue, I think, for a lot of people, um, which is the selling of dice control, the dice control business. And it's big business. There are, it, there's hardware, tables and rigs and all the things. There's DVDs, there's books. There's books written by people who have no business writing a book. There are DVDs being sold by people who filmed something in their bedroom with a mask on. 
that are giving you some dice control secret for 800 bucks. There are people who are inviting you to their garage for a weekend, calling it an academy. There are um, people who will come to your hotel in Vegas and show you against your bed how to shoot dice in a hotel room. Come on. This person's having the negative reaction that I have to that. I think it's crap. I think the snake oil thing has given dice controlling the, uh, the worst possible view. And I think people associate dice control with this, not with the practice of trying to work the dice. And I think that's unfortunate. So my series here attempts to stop all of the negativity stuff and focus in on the activity itself. Is it possible? And if so, how? This person is crying out for that, right? There's too many outcomes and whatever, but the real reaction here, the emotional response is the money. And we have to be honest about that. This person here, again, doesn't believe it works because of the back wall. Um, I highlight this one here only because they are a rhythm roller, which is cool to see a rhythm roller um, talk about what they do, which is I know they're random, but I'm going to throw them the same way anyway. I think that's great. And I also like the adult response down here, which is I see dice controllers in the same way. If it builds confidence, good for you. I think that's the way we should be looking at this from both ends of it. If you're a random roller and I'm a dice controller, cool. I don't even care. Like that's the way it ought to be. Um, and this person does a good job of, of, of closing strong. I, I appreciate that. And uh, the, finally, this one I couldn't agree more with. Um, it, when I opened Casino John, it's going to have nothing but craft tables in it. You can be assured of that. Um, and it'll be dice controller friendly because uh, I want them to have a great experience. And I don't fear a dice controller as a casino owner. And I think they don't either. The tables have built in countermeasures to, to, to go against the physics of the dice flying. We'll talk a lot about that later. But more importantly, dice controllers live on many levels. There are, there are some that are really, really good and skilled. But there are many who are not. And the many who are not bet like they have the skill they don't have. In fact, they do what I call over betting their skill or overplaying their hand. And the casinos are okay with that. I think the poster who put this out there is not okay with it. I think this person is saying they're tired of seeing people who think they can control the dice dropping a paycheck across because they think they have enough skill to drop a nine out there. Okay. That's a negative window into it. And the emotional responses that we see, almost everything here, there is some tactics in here. There are some people talking about how hard it is to stay on axis. Some folks talking about the back wall. Somebody brought up the university serve or university study that we'll get into. Most people are reacting negatively to the people, not the practice. And I think that was the most eye-opening piece of this entire experiment so far was the negative reaction to dice controllers as a people, not dice controlling as a thing. And I think that, wow, that's a, uh, that's interesting stuff for sure. Let's, let's actually look at the cases for and against dice control. I think it's interesting to see where the argument is framed by both sides of the, of the debate here. So a dice controller, the case four here, a dice controller will tell you that physics are real. And the number one thing that they will tell you is that they have used physics in such a way to control the force, velocity, impact, energy dispersion to make the dice quote unquote, do what they want to do, or at least harness physics in such a way that they can hopefully reduce the amount of random. It seems like a pretty tall order, but that's the dice controller philosophy. And to follow that up, I will tell you this, and, and you can you should agree with me here. Humans are capable of superhuman things. And if you've ever played the game of golf, I use golf as an example all the time. Golf is, is a really hard game to master. The physics of golf make that almost seem impossible. You've got this however long a golf club is with a tiny head, a ball with dimples on it, the vectors and, and force and the torque that it takes to get a, your club head back through a swing and actually hit that little tiny ball perfectly square so that it flies not straight because you can't hit a golf ball straight. It flies on a predictable curve. It's fantastic that people can do that. If that's possible, other things can be overcome that are limitations of physics. So I think that's an example. 
I've also I, I've come into a new sport. Um, if you ever if you watch the Paralympics, this is the year 2021 as I'm filming this. The Paralympics, they just had a, a, a sport that's called goalball where everybody puts a blindfold on and they're laying on the floor. They're on their hands and knees. And it's basically you start from one end of a basketball court to the other and you throw a ball. And somehow with a blindfold on, people are blocking shots. I mean, the fact that people are capable of things like that, it's it's mind blowing what people can do. So when you when you look at that, you go, yeah, yeah if, if these things can't be done, why not this? Like there's a why can't this be true element to this. And it gets dice controllers kind of juiced up and fired up to go and chase and chase and work and work. Now, there's also the non-quantifiable argument here, which is this. Um, if it wasn't real, if dice control was impossible, why all the countermeasures at the casinos? And there are countermeasures at the casinos. You know that there's a back wall, there's a bouncy table, there's all sorts of things in play that are there to make sure the dice are randomized. Are they there to stop the dice controller? Not necessarily but they are there to ensure randomness and to impart more randomness. If dice control wasn't real, those things wouldn't be necessary. And I think that's where a dice controller will often go as kind of a last resort argument, but there is an element of truth to that. So what's the case against dice control? Well, the anti-dice control crowd also uses physics as the primary argument. And if you look at the physics of a table with the varying degrees of bounce you'll find at tables within a casino and of course between the casinos. The bounciness is there to impart randomness to the dice and it makes the life of the dice controller that much harder because they can't adjust to different surfaces and that's a problem. The casinos also have the alligator backing on the tables. You have to hit the back wall which means that alligator triangle shaped thing on the back wall is going to impart randomness on the dice. The anti-dice control crowd will tell you, you can't overcome those things no matter how much you practice or how much money you spend. And I think the money is a big piece of their argument as well. And to some degree, I think that's a very, very valid argument. Now, to be a dice controller, you have to practice. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you energy. Those aren't free. Your time is worth something. So that's a part of it too. But you've also got to build by or construct some kind of a table to practice on. You've got to get felt. You've got to get the underlayment. You've got to buy the alligator back. You've got to get it all set up. It ain't cheap. The setup that I've got behind me is not cheap to put together. So there's a cost involved, uh, both physical cost and time cost to get good at this. And then you get the people that tried it. They did it. They did all the work. They spent all the money. They tried, tried, tried and said, can't do it. <laughs> I mean, this is, I got worse. I never got better. I got worse at throwing the dice and I gave it everything I could and I can't beat the system. I can't beat physics. Therefore it's random and I'm just thrown in the towel. That's a valid way of thinking. It is. Um, there are folks in the dice control community that will say that's a bad way of thinking. I don't believe that. I think, yeah, you spent the money, you put the effort in your determination. It ain't working for you. Fine. That's valid. Now, the bigger part of the cost argument, and I think the biggest source of negativity from the anti-dice control to the dice control movement is the business of dice control. Now, the business of dice control is people selling prefab practice tables, selling prefab, you know, throwing stations for money, for profit. There are folks selling DVDs. There are folks giving lessons in their garage. There are folks will do private lessons online. There are folks that will hold big seminars, right? There's a lot of money in people chasing the dream, right? There is no such thing as get rich quick. There's no such thing as ain't going to fail. There's no such thing as it always works, but people get sucked into that. And I think the fact that there are maybe a handful of people who are really solid dice controllers, there are hundreds that are not. And the hundreds that are not that are trying to sell you something are given the movement a bad name. The dice control movement itself has become its own worst enemy as a result of that. And that I think is a big thing. So when people have this, I think this gut reaction of dice control is fake. When you hear that, what I hear is somebody is really upset with the dice control movement trying to earn profit from suckers. And I think that's a big deal. It's hard to overcome that. And I wanna make this series 
go beyond that. I want to transcend the emotional arguments on both sides. I want to transcend the it's BS argument because somebody's trying to sell something. I want to transcend the, of course it's real because if it wasn't real, the casinos wouldn't make it so hard on us. Those are things you can't quantify. What you can look at is the physics of it, the actual way that we do this. And I think that is where the series is going to go. We've got, again, a bunch of videos that we're going to explore that part of it. And I think that's where I want to keep us talking. If you're going to leave comments on this video, and I encourage you to do so, leave comments on the physical side of things. Let's leave the emotion out of it because it's just not helpful, frankly. So the last question, number five here, can it be proven? Can you prove dice control beyond a doubt works, is possible, or doesn't work, is not possible? We're going to find out. There are a lot of people that have tried to prove the negative. There's a university study that used a machine to emulate how a dice controller throws dice, logged thousands of rolls to prove one way or the other. There are people that have set up home rigs that attempt to show that it will or will not work. Lots of great slow motion video out there of people who are great dice controllers showing their dice being randomized off the back wall. So can we prove it? I'm going to do my best to collate all that information to try and suss through it with you, to do my own slow motion trials and try and explain the physics as best I can. And we'll leave it up to you at the end to decide if it was compelling enough to sway you to say, nope, it ain't true, or yep, I want to give this a shot and see what it's all about even more. So if we can, as I said earlier, if we can keep this series and our discussions and our comments on the physical level and the non-emotional level, I think we're going to get somewhere. What I want from everybody watching this series is a wide open mind. Listen to what I say, watch what I present, make up your own mind, but let's have a common sense and thoughtful debate about it. That's what I want to get this to. I want to, I want to eliminate some of those comments that we saw earlier from the anti and from the pro crowd and bring us right into here and say, you know what? There's definitely room to discuss this. And there's definitely things that I think are interesting and hopefully come to some sort of coalescence on this really kind of hairy topic of dice control. So um, that's really it for this first episode. Stay with me here. We've got another nine, maybe 10 episodes. I've got interviews coming up with controllers and anti-controllers, and it's going to be an amazing deep dive into this really hot button issue. Um, again, thanks for tuning in. I'm John. This was ProCraps, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks again.